I'm David. I'm from Iowa. Uh, I'm an IT architecture specialist. Uh, it's a fancy name for a system administrator for iWeb's own infrastructure. So I do stuff like uh, OpenStack, Ceph, Swift, Puppet, Sand Server. It's fun stuff. Uh, I love Python, and I work with uh, high availability uh, web and database clusters. What is Ceph? Does anyone know what Ceph is? OK, less hands than Swift. I'm going to have a tough job. <laughs> All right, so Ceph is a distributed object store and file system designed to provide excellent performance, reliability, and scalability. That's right off uh, Ceph's website. That's not for me? No? OK. Um, the interesting thing, uh, maybe for you guys, is that Ceph was created by Sage Whale as part of a PhD uh, thesis in computer science. So whenever I have a problem, I try and find if someone else has solved that problem. This guy had the problem, and he fixed it himself by creating a whole storage solution. So it's kind of awesome. Uh, Sage Whale co-founded co DreamHost. It's a web hosting company, a bit like iWeb. Uh, he also founded Ink Tank, the company that is today uh, behind Ceph. Uh, maybe a bit like Canonical for Ubuntu. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's the enterprise behind uh, the product. Um, Ink Tank is also a mentor in the next and uh, the upcoming uh, Google Summer of Code. Google Summer of Code uh, has a wide range of products for students, students to work on. So uh, they're going to have projects for Ceph uh, in their next summer. Um, before talking about Ceph, I'm going to do a little bit of context around distributed storage. I think Marcos did a nice job with uh, Swift. Um, distribu distributed storage. Um, so you have a laptop. You're a human, I, think, I hope. <laughs> uh, you have your computer and you have your disk. I mean, this is a laptop. Uh, a lot of people here around with a laptop. So that's local storage, right? You have your laptop, you have a disk. And then you have a small business. So maybe you have some money, you purchase the server, and you have a whole lot of disks and a whole lot of employees. Uh, your company is successful, uh, you're now with this, and that's a problem. And why, why that is a problem? It's because this computer, if it fails, your company fails. You don't want that, right? Um, and this is the problem that uh, is often tackled by something like more servers, right? So then you have something like this. You have a lot of humans, you have a lot of servers, you have a lot of disks. But the, the problem with that is how do you address each of these logical computers, right? So each of these are different servers. Uh, you maybe have uh, different uh, file shares on different servers. It's, it's a mess to deal with. So this is why big corporate corporations have uh, done something that's called SANS. SANS looks something like, a bit like this. It's oversimplified. It's a big, uh, expensive uh, appliance, right? There's a lot of computers. There's a lot of disks. The difference is the, the black wrapper around the whole thing is that the SAN is uh, one logical unit, right? You address that, uh, you, you, you don't talk to tens of servers. You talk to one server or one IP address or whatever the configuration may be. But the idea is that you address one single device. And often, or not often, but like all the time, uh, there's going to be uh, logic and intelligence in the SAN uh, so that there's replications and uh, you don't lose your data if you lose a server, if you lose a disk, and so on. So now, I don't like SANS. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the hardware is expensive. Uh, the license is expensive. The support is expensive. Uh, the, the software and the hardware is often proprietary. Uh, and there's vendor lock-in. So you can't, often you can't really mix and match uh, your hardware and software, you go with a solution, you stay with it, and uh, you have to deal with that. Ceph. Ceph is meant, uh, just like Swift, is meant to run on commodity hardware. That means just like any hardware. You have computers at home, you could run Ceph on it if you wanted to. Uh, actually, if I didn't have a network attached storage at home, I would probably run Ceph. Uh, it's free, free as in candy, doesn't cost anything. Uh, Ink Tank does provide enterprise support, and uh, uh, a bit like a Canonical does. 
but otherwise it's free. Uh, it's open source. The code is on GitHub. You can look it up and uh, send pull requests. The guys over there are pretty uh, uh, reactive. Uh, and it's awesome. It's a feature, right? No? <laughs> Uh, the soft software stack. So now we're going to de delve in a bit in the details of what Ceph actually uh, looks like at the software level. So you have um, RADOS, which is uh, an acronym for a Reliable Autonomic Distributed Object Store. And um, a bit like Swift is an object store, and it takes care of replicating stuff uh, so you don't lose data whenever you lose a computer or a disk. The core of Ceph is actually Rados because uh, everything is replicated in that object store and you have uh, LibRados that sits on top of Rados. And LibRados is a set of bindings and you can talk to Rados through various APIs. Uh, there's uh, bindings for C, C++, Java, Python, Ruby, PHP. A Python script, for instance, you can import um, the, 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 the Ceph libraries and talk directly to, to uh, LibRados. And then there's um, uh, components that are provided directly within Ceph that use LibRados and allow you to work with Ceph. So you have Rados Gateway. Uh, I, I think right now it's, it's renamed the Ceph Gateway or something. Uh, but anyway, um, it's uh, a REST interface to Rados. So it allows you to use Ceph uh, uh, as an alternative to Swift. Uh, we can talk with that about that a bit later on. Uh, it's, it, has, uh, it provides um, an API that is compatible with uh, Swift S, uh, Amazon S3 and uh, Swift. You have RBD, that stands for Rados Block Device. Um, it's, it allows you to use Ceph uh, for block devices. So a hard drive, a hard drive over a network, think iSCSI, allows you to do that. And then there's CephFS, that is, um, a distributed file system. Uh, I heard uh, earlier someone was talking about GlusterFS. That's something a bit similar to GlusterFS. We can talk about that later as well. The Ceph daemons. So, and resolution. Hang on. Can we? Oh, okay. Uh, I hope it's not too small for the people uh, at the back. Um, the most, uh, uh, the, the, the Ceph daemon that works with the actual hard drives is called OSD. Uh, it stands for Object Storage Daemon. And the OSD is essentially a piece of software that more or less takes over uh, an actual hard drive. So what happens is that you'll have one daemon per disk. Uh, so for one server, you'll have many disks, right? Wow. Um, so you'll have many OSDs on a single server, typically. So you have uh, one server with eight disks in it. You know, you're going to have eight OSDs. Um, the, the cool thing about OSDs is that they don't really care about the, the hardware they're residing in. So the hardware, like uh, for instance, uh, if, um, if a specific line of server hardware is discontinued, well, you can just purchase another kind of server and it's going to work. Um, there's no hard limit to scaling uh, the amount of OSDs. You can have up to thousands uh, of OSDs without a problem. Scales just as well as Swift. Um, the important thing uh, is that it serves data to clients directly. So when I say a client is, um, is an, an application or your code, when it talks to Ceph, um, it will talk to monitors and it will get to monitors later. Um, uh, the client will know where the data resides uh, inside the cluster, and it's, it's going to be able to talk to the OSDs directly and pull the data from there. Um, and the OSD is the one taking care of the intelligent peering and replication to make sure that uh, everything stays uh, consistent. So I have uh, this uh, unfortunate uh, little schema here. Um, so you have, uh, for instance, the OSD, the daemon. The file system can be anything like uh, BDRFS, XFS, or XT4. Ceph currently recommends um, XFS. It's like the best middle ground between a BTRFS that isn't quite 
uh, production ready yet. Uh, and you have your disks. And then you have going to have plenty of OSDs uh, inside a cluster. You have the monitors. Um, you're, gonna, you're not going to have as many monitors as you're going to have OSDs. And typically, you're going to have a small uh, odd number. And the reason you're going to have an odd number is because you need a quorum. So um, the, the, it's like, uh, I don't know, you need the quorum. That, that, is that a good word? Yeah, right? Um, the monitor, uh, hang on. This slide is, oh, isn't that better? Awesome. Um, the monitors take care of maintaining the cluster state. So they're the ones aware of what's going on in the cluster, pretty much. They're going to have, they're, they're going to know who the cluster members are. So who are the monitors, who are the OSDs, and who are the other components of, uh, in the Ceph cluster. Um, they're aware of the placement groups and the objects. It's some, it's a terminology we'll be looking at a bit later. Uh, but they also know what's the overall health of the cluster. And they're going to ones be telling you, hey, there's a problem. So uh, this is the role of the monitor. Uh, it takes care of managing the crush map as well. The crush map is something, uh, maybe uh, it's the equivalent to, to Swift's ring. Uh, it's, it's quite different, though. But uh, it's, like a, it's the equivalent. It's crush. The crush map is um, the one uh, that is able to uh, it's, it's the one that is uh, able to uh, let you know where the data resides, uh, essentially. And it's also the entry point for Ceph clients. So you have your application, and you have um, a host name or a IP, perhaps. Um, and you're actually going to talk to a monitor. You're going to retrieve the crush map, which tells you what, what's the cluster, what the cluster looks like. And uh, by talking to the monitor, the client will know afterwards where to push and pull the data. Oh, no. All right. Um, you have the metadata server. It's only used for CephFS, the shared and distributed the file system. Uh, unfortunately, it's not really production ready yet. And I really wish it was, because it's really awesome. Um, like, there's people and organization that use it in production. I know, uh, uh, I know of a couple of companies that do, but Ink Tank is not re yet ready to officially support that product in their enterprise offering, so it's not quite ready yet. Uh, it's a, maybe a matter of a few months still. But anyway, um, the metadata server it manages the file system metadata, so things like. Uh, timestamps, permissions, uh, ownership of your files and folders, uh, and the actual folder and file uh, hierarchy. Um, it's scalable, which means um, there you, you can have a, as many metadata servers as you want. And the interesting thing is that the metadata is stored in Rados. So this means that you can lose your metadata server, but you're not really going to lose your metadata because it, it, it lives in the Ceph cluster. And that means that you can, it, it's, it's more or less stateless, so you can provision and decommission metadata servers as you want. And there's also the dynamic subtree partition. Um, it's, um, it's a complicated concept, but more or less, uh, the metadata server is aware of uh, which files in your uh, file hierarchy is being hit the most, essentially. And it's going to partition your file hierarchy uh, dynamically between the metadata servers uh, so that um, it, like, uh, one metadata server could perhaps be handling just like a, a small part of your file system while the two, three, or other metadata servers would be taking care of the rest of the file tree because this one spot is being hit so much. <coughs> There's the Rados gateway. It's, uh, I talked about it earlier. It's one of the demons. Uh, it's a REST-based interface to Rados. It's compatible with uh, S3 and Swift APIs. It's cool enough already, right? 
Am I right? Yes, no? Uh, but what really makes Ceph unique? It's Crush, and I talked about it a little bit earlier. Uh, Crush stands for Controlled Replication Under Scalable Hashing. Crush, it's an algorithm, and it was the main topic for a Sage's PhD uh, thesis. Um, it's, it, um, it pretends it does uh, pseudo random placement. That means it's going to place data apparently randomly, but not really. Uh, it means it's a de deterministic algorithm that will, for this, this one given operation, it will always do the same thing. Um, the calculations are client side. Uh, if, I, if I do uh, a parallel to Swift, Swift uh, has these databases for metadata and it has um, the array that is able to compute uh, where the data lives. Um, with Crush, the clients are able to tell where the data lives without querying uh, a proxy server or a middleware server. Uh, it just knows. Uh, Crush will distribute the data uh, uniformly, evenly, evenly, thanks. Uh, it's stable, and by stable, it doesn't mean like, well, it's, it works well. Uh, it means that uh, if you lose uh, a disk or a server, it will move data as little as possible, and the OSDs will peer between themselves, so uh, if you lose a server and you have uh, maybe 10 other servers, it's not the end of the world. You're not going to be impacted that much. Um, it's configurable. That means it, it can be infrastructure topology aware. And by that, it means that you can, in Ceph, define, well, these servers uh, are living in this rack, and these servers are living in this row, in this room, in this data center. And then that allows you to do something like uh, replication uh, to different uh, failure domains. So you can have, for instance, um, okay, I'd like to do three replications, but one in another data center. So you can do that with Ceph. Um, you can configure replication, so two, three, four, none. Uh, and you can weight uh, your different OSDs. So maybe if you have uh, faster drives, maybe you want data to be uh, cycled in them a bit more, well, you can weight those drives a little bit uh, more. Uh, or you can weight them down so they're going to be used less. Um, how Crush distributes data on Ceph? Uh, there's pools. And pools, um, uh, they're a log logical container for your data. They're like folder, but at the same time, they're not, they're not like folders. Um, they're really, uh, you could work with just one pool um, and you could work just fine. But the idea is that um, the crush configuration I talked about earlier, they're usually going to be set on your pools. So perhaps uh, for one set of data, you'd like to have two replicas, less important data, but for other information, you'd like to have three replicas. So you're going to have two different pools and different configuration for each of these pools. Uh, these pools contain placement groups. I'm going to talk about them later. Um, images, for instance, Radius block device, uh, they belong in pools. So when you create uh, a block device, you're going to use, uh, you're, going to, you're going to have to specify in which pool uh, this block device will reside. Um, Images are striped across placement groups. That means your block devices are actually replicated uh, and consistent across a cluster. Um, and I talked about uh, replication per pool and uh, custom crush rules. Placement groups. The actual objects, the, the binary, yeah, your files, uh, they're, they're stored in placement groups. And the interesting thing is that the objects aren't really replicated. It's the placement groups that are. And there's going to be a little schema uh, later that uh, will give you a better idea of what it looks like. Um, the rule of thumb is 100 placement groups per OSD. And basically, um, your objects are going to be split amongst your placement groups. And uh, 
the more placement groups you have, the more evenly your data will be distributed uh, amongst your, your cluster. Uh, but the more PGs you have, also the more uh, CPU intensive it becomes. So that's like a, that's a, that's a hard limit. So you have here a, a little uh, diagram. So you have, uh, for instance, your binary data, uh, an image. Uh, it goes through crush. It gets split in, in two objects. And then you have this pool, like the pink, uh, the pink uh, square uh, rectangle. And then you have your placement groups. And then in each placement groups, the objects are being uh, stored in the placement groups. So in this example, I have a replication factor of two. So if I look at this little red square, I have this red square here and the second red square here. It's not going to be anywhere else. So what happens if you lose an OSD? So you have this little diagram here. And I lost, I lost this placement group here. Uh, it's really oversimplified because there's a lot of placement groups on a single drive, but it gives you an idea. So what happens is that um, the, I lost a red and uh, bright uh, pale yellow uh, uh, square. So the OSDs will peer between themselves. And like right now, the state of the pool is degraded because uh, there's some files that are replicated and consistent. So the OSDs, the OSDs will peer between themselves and um, replicate the data into other placement groups. Uh, let's talk money, because uh, money uh, drives a lot of things, right? A real life scenario. Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go over the server specifications. You can take a picture if you want or something. Uh, it's something uh, that is uh, typical for a storage server, uh, and it's something uh, close to what we'd use uh, at iWeb for uh, a, a big storage solution. Uh, the idea and what I'm trying to show you is that uh, in the past, before uh, having, uh, before Ceph was even considered, what we do for high availability and failover uh, and data security is we, we would have two storage servers in DRBD, which is a, um, more or less a RAID over network uh, technology. Uh, was that good? Yeah, right? Uh, and uh, with the RBD, the thing, uh, the thing is that uh, usually you have one active server and one passive server. So basically you're paying twice as much for really just one server worth of data. And the thing with Ceph is that you're gonna have these two same servers, but they're both gonna be active at the same time. Um, so for numbers, for instance, uh, for uh, $18,000, um, let's pretend I have RAID for performance and data security. And to give you an idea, I put for DRBD, both RAID 10 and RAID 50 configurations. So for RAID 10, uh, uh, more or less uh, 32 terabytes worth of data. If I have three replicas, which is the, more, the most secure, uh, well, three replicas, I mean, it's pretty safe, right, in Ceph. So you're gonna have 43 terabytes, so it's more than 11 terabytes worth more of data. Um, and if we go RAID 50 over the RBD, because we need more space and we don't really care about performance that much, we're gonna have uh, 57 terabytes worth of data. So if we need more space in Ceph, we can tone down the replication count to two, and uh, we're gonna have uh, 65 terabytes. And also keep in mind that with Ceph, both of the servers are active, and that's worth a lot because uh, there are other bottlenecks involved, such as uh, network throughput and stuff like that. Stuff with OpenStack, because I got to talk about OpenStack too, huh? right? Um, block storage. Uh, Ceph is integrated with Cinder and Nova, both in Grizzly, Havana, and Nicehouse. Um, it's similar to IceKZ, but better, yeah, as in 
Uh, there's a kernel module right in the Linux right in the Linux kernel, and it's been there for a while too, for four years now. Um, so if I want to mount a block device over Ceph, it's really like four lines. I load the kernel module, I map the block device, the 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 the, the Ceph block device to my server, I format the the the, the disk image. And I mount it, and it's good to go. I can use it. It's over the network. It's replicated, uh, and it's highly available. Images. Uh, it's integrated with Glance uh, in OpenStack. Glance is a project that allows you to uh, upload your images, such as um, I don't know, uh, Q Qcow or QMU uh, uh, images. And uh, Glance natively is able to talk with Ceph and store and retrieve images from there. Object storage. Uh, it's an alternative to Swift and OpenStack. Uh, it works. I've tried it. Uh, uh, and it's compatible with uh, API with Swift and Amazon S3. Um, the thing with, um, with uh, object storage with uh, Ceph is that Ceph uh, um, uh, right off the bat is a synchronous replication. So uh, Swift earlier, uh, Marcos said that uh, it's able to uh, do uh, writes at two places, and then it's going to tell you, okay, I I've done the write, and then it's going to, in the background, replicate a third time. <coughs> Ceph is not going to let you do that. It's going to send you the ACK only once all the replicas are done. And um, they've done something in the latest release of Ceph. I haven't had the time to try it out yet, but they have actually done like several zones and federations. So maybe like they've done something uh, with that uh, that's able to uh, tackle that problem. Uh, shared and distributed file system, CephFS. It's an alternative to GlusterFS, OCFS, and stuff like that. Uh, it's POSIX compliant, uh, and you can mount a, a CephFS over kernel module or over um, uh, Fuse soon. And as you see, you smile smiley face, because uh, I'm sad. I have a really good use case for it, but I, I'm not able to do it. Uh, who uses Ceph? A whole lot of people. Um, I'm sure you recognize some of the companies listed in there. Uh, there are either uh, known users of Ceph, they contribute to Ceph, or uh, they're actual ink tank customers. Questions? 